Now will you turn with me in your Bibles to these two fascinating chapters in the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5, which according to Hebrews chapter 11 constitute the story of Barak, but which according to chapters 4 and 5 of Judges tends much more to be the story of Deborah. I'm very aware of the fact that the last time I preached on Barak, and it's a lot of years ago now, I was pretty hard on the poor chap. I think I've mellowed a little, and uh, I'm not prepared to criticize him quite so much uh, as we preach tonight. There are some people who say that reading history is the best and most comprehensive education that you can get. I don't want to debate that issue, but would affirm certainly that reading history and reading Old Testament history enlarges our view of things. And in reading history, we escape from the inhibition of feeling that the whole world started and starts and ends with our few little years. It doesn't. And it is very important that we should enlarge our thinking to consider everything in the context of the sweep of history. And when we do, we see that there are trends in history and there are fluctuations in history and that, of course, is the essential pattern of the book of Judges. When, when after one judge died, the, the nation declined, and then when they got into a real mess, they cried to God, and God rescued them, and the nation came up again. And then the same thing happened, and there were these fluctuations. And we have to learn to see these fluctuations right through history to our own day and generation. And we have to learn not only to see the fluctuations and the trends, we have to learn to relate the past to the present. For the present stage of history, whether it's in the book of Judges or in the 1980s, the present stage of history didn't happen all of a sudden. It developed out of past stages. And the past enables us to understand and to interpret the present. And then, because we are learning to link the generations together, we can go on to draw some conclusions, such as saying, if things go on as they are, then the future will be this or that or the other. I don't know what conclusions you would draw with regard to the history of our own nation at this particular juncture in history, but I tend to feel that if things go on as they are, and as the trend of the past couple of decades has indicated, then the future is going to be a guy grim future. And we draw the, begin to draw conclusions about the future to the effect that it, there will be certain elements of stability. I think there are some indications that that might be so. And certain elements of decline. And I also think that that is so. And this pattern of the past leading to the present and leading into the future and this principle that we are expounding is true of individuals. Now, you think, you think what your life has been over the past number of years and where that has brought you and what direction that is pointing you spiritually for the days that lie ahead. I, 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 I think that very seldom, apart from the grace of God, does, does the trend of our life take sudden changes of direction. And this principle applies to individuals, it applies to congregations, and it applies to nations. And what is in the bloodstream physically, morally, and spiritually 
works its effect for good or for ill throughout the whole system. Now, those of you who know your Bibles know that in coming to the book of Judges, we come, we come to the stage of Israel's history after the death of Joshua. And after the death of Joshua, to begin with, things, things were very promising. And then, remember we mentioned it the other week, that the children of Israel did right in the sight of God. The whole of Joshua's life and throughout the whole of the life of the elders who lived on longer after Joshua. But then we come to the book of Judges, chapter 1, for example, if I've got the right verse, and verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Verse 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. As they had commanded, been commanded to do to take possession of the whole land. And very often at the, at the top... At the top of the Bible, you know, when, when you get a little indication of chapter headings, you find in some Bibles that the heading of the page refers to Israel's incomplete obedience. Now notice, at this stage, they didn't do anything bad. They just didn't do what they should have been doing. And sometimes in, in pastoral counseling, people say to their minister, Oh, I, I haven't been doing anything bad. Well, fair enough. Uh, you've, you've got to accept it when people say that, even though sometimes you've got suspicions. But then you must go on to say, Well, that, that's all, all very well. You haven't been doing anything bad. But have you been doing what God was calling you and commanding you to do? Or is your, is your obedience... Incomplete. And then if you look with me down into chapter 2 of the book of Judges at verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work which the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. Verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. Oh, that's very solemn. The growing, gener put it like this, the growing children didn't know the Lord the way their fathers had known the Lord. That's a very solemn situation. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work which he had done for Israel. Then we put in the bit about their incomplete obedience. Verse 11, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods. Do, do, you, see what we're, do you see what we're learning here? That incomplete obedience could we put it in different language, holding back from God leads to going back. Incomplete obedience leads to no obedience and soon thereafter to disobedience. So if you, if you are saying in your heart tonight, well, preacher, I, I acknowledge I'm I'm not living my Christian life the way that I should be living it. Well, now, that's incomplete obedience. That means that you're on the very edge of the situation in which you begin to go back from God altogether. 
And if we were to take time tonight to go right through to the very last chapter of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 23, we will find it recorded there where this kind of living led to. Because every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A situation of anarchy with no objective standards and no principles, no basic principles for the life of of society. And if you're saying, well, preacher, that sounds very like the 1980s, then I agree with you. Because the philosophy of so many nowadays is, if, if you feel it's all right, then it is all right. No objective standards, no spiritual or moral principles for the life of society. And right through the book of Judges, as we indicated earlier, the pattern is one of decline. And they cried to the Lord and there was recovery. And in recovery they became complacent. And in their spiritual complacency they declined. And if you took the trouble to go right through the book of Judges, you would find it recorded there that sometimes for 10 years, sometimes 20, sometimes 30, sometimes 40 years, great spells of time, the nation simply was not aware of the spiritual cause of their national problems. And for these long spells of years, they were not aware of the seriousness of their situation, nor were they aware that the powers of evil were on the ascendant with long-term destructive consequences. And I doubt if there are any people in our Houses of Parliament just now, or very few, who are aware of the fact in any significant way that the powers of evil within our own nation are on the ascendant and the destructive power for the dissolution of society is raging before our very eyes. Everybody's been terribly shocked, or so they say, by what they saw on television about the murder by the mob of the two soldiers in Ireland. How long will it be before that simply fades out of people's minds and they forget? I suggest that it won't be all that long. Because one of the devil's great techniques is to cause us to forget very quickly what we have seen of the, the emergence and the eruptions of the powers of evil which are bent on destroying society. Now this brings us to chapter 4 of the book of Judges. And in the first three verses of the chapter, we have the story of national crisis. And if you read it very carefully, you will see that it is not only national crisis, it speaks or it indic speaks of or indicates loss of national sovereignty. Oh, you say, preacher, this does have contemporary rings about it. Yes, I quite agree. National crisis, loss of national sovereignty, loss of independence, and the life of the nation of Israel, apply it as we go on, the life of the nation controlled by outside forces. Think in our own situation, for example, of great tracts of Scotland that are owned by other people, not only south of the border, but abroad. Think of it. Great tracts of Scotland no longer belong to us. Think of some of the great companies of our nation in which overseas governments have almost, not quite, but almost 
a controlling interest. Think again, for example, of the almost unbelievable policies of the European community determining to a great extent the policies, the economic policies, not least the agricultural policies of the United Kingdom. Or think, for example, of the International Monetary Fund. I don't suppose many of you get all that het up about the International Monetary Fund, but having trained as a banker before I became a minister, I keep an interest in the, the, the financial pages of the Glasgow Herald. And you become aware of the fact that the finance of the nation, to a great extent, is controlled by factors that are out with the nation. And other people make decisions that impinge upon all that we mean by national sovereignty and national freedom. Now, it was exactly like that in the book of Judges, chapter 4, in the story of Israel. There was political, economic, social, moral, and commercial decline. And according to verse 3 of our chapter, this situation went on for 20 years, and it took 20 years for the nation to begin to realize that the root cause of their problems was spiritual. Now, I think very, very few in the Houses of Parliament believe that to be the case. There is an almost total absence of any reference to God or to moral standards or to objective principles. And this was the situation. And the picture is really quite astonishing. The picture is very contemporary. You remember just a little time ago we were reading in chapter 2 of Judges earlier on tonight. And I refer you to Judges chapter 2 verses 11, 12 and 13. And you will see there, stated very, very simply but very clearly, the religious decline of the nation and the almost total distortion of the religious life of the nation. And they abandoned the God of their fathers. They regarded the old-time religion as being old-time and therefore no longer relevant. Just in the same way nowadays as people regard the Bible as being largely outdated and, and after all it's, it's just a cultural thing and you've got to qualify all that's said in the Bible in terms of the culture of these far off days and you end up with a result in which the, 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 the Bible doesn't really apply to anything or anybody. This is what was happening in Israel. The Israel that had the Ten Commandments given by the hand of God. They abandoned the God of their fathers. They accommodated their religion, the religion of the true God, to the religion... Are, are you aware of the fact? And uh, this is what Stuart Lamont was writing about in the Glasgow Herald on Saturday, and I'm always disturbed when I agree with Stuart Lamont, but I did this week. He was pointing out that the situation has almost reached with the help of a lot of rather feeble clergymen, he said, in which you mustn't say any more the words of Jesus, I am the, the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Nor must you preach as the Acts of the Apostles preach, that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Oh, well, you see, we, we've got to recognize that all the other religions, they've all got, and well, you know, we're all, we're all going the same way in the end. Was it not very long ago it was recorded in the press about the Archbishop of Canterbury extolling the virtues and the benefits of the Hindu religion. Little wonder he was accused of nailing his colors to the fence. But you see, what we are reading about in Judges is what's happening in our own day and generation. And the people of Israel created for themselves a new religion 
a religion that suited them better because it allowed them to live the kind of lives that they wanted, especially in the realm of sexual behavior. It's all very contemporary, isn't it? And if you were to turn over, I said that chapter 5 of Judges is something of a commentary on chapter 4. If you turned over to Judges chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, in the days of Shamgar, in the days of Jael, caravans ceased. That is, the roads were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. And peasantry, village life ceased in Israel. Well, you say, what does that mean? Well, it speaks, amongst other things, about social decline. It speaks of thuggery and vandalism so that people were afraid to travel. I don't know if they were afraid to go out at night, but certainly the, 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 the main travel routes were dangerous because you are, you are liable to be ambushed. This was the kind of situation. A situation in the nation that was marked by contempt for life and property and riddled with terrorism. And if you look at verse 8 of chapter 5, when new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? And the answer was no. The nation had lost its backbone. No one was prepared to stand up and fight against evil. No, no doubt nobody, nobody was very willing to go into the courts and testify in the courts with regard to crimes that had been, had been committed because they were afraid. Now, I suppose I would be afraid to do that, and I hope by the grace of God, afraid though I was, I would do it. Because, you see, my friends, if, if nobody is prepared to speak against evil and stand against evil, then evil will just carry all before it. And this was the situation in the book of Judges at the time of Barak and Deborah. And to begin with, there was nobody prepared to stand up and speak against and fight against evil except Deborah, the Old Testament Mrs. Whitehouse. And when you think of how much that woman has been slandered and mocked, I think the rest of us, especially the men, should feel thoroughly ashamed that the one standing in the gap against the tides of pornography in our land is a woman. Oh, one or two other men now in Parliament are beginning to do it as well. And so we come to Deborah. The only woman ruler in Israel, except, I think, for the bad queen, Athaliah. And the only judge, I think, who was called a prophet. And we are just, Deborah was a prophetess. She was a judge. That was the administrator of justice. And she was a prophetess. She was the, oh, I better say it carefully, she was the spokesperson of God, for God. And she brought the message from God. And there are some people, I don't want to digress because our time's rushing on, but there are some people who use this exception, the leadership of a woman in Israel, they use this exception, the exception of an exceptionable woman, in their argument with regard to the ordination of women elders and women ministers. They say, oh, well, you see, regardless of what you say, there was this exception. No doubt at all, Deborah was a mighty woman used by God. Nobody would deny that. But when Paul, by the Holy Spirit, was giving clear instruction in his epistles, particularly the pastoral epistles, for church order... Paul would have been well aware of the story of Deborah and of other women who served and supported both Jesus and himself, but Paul made no mention of even significant exceptions. But as I say, I don't want to digress. 
And the burden of the story here in Judges chapters 4 and 5 is the lack of men for the work of God. Now, that's a slightly inaccurate statement because there were a lot of men in Israel. There were a lot of men among the people of God. So it's not so much a lack of men for the work of God, but a lack of unwillingness, a lack of willingness among men in the work of God. The men were there, but they were not willing to do the work of God in such a grim and demanding situation. And it is against that background that we have the story of Barak, and he, he is not a strong character, or so it would appear. But of course it says in the, in the New Testament that God has chosen the weak things of the world to do his work. And some of us are very grateful for that. Barak, not a strong character, is seen in this story and he is, he is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great men of faith. And if you feel that Deborah is overlooked and slighted, in that 11th chapter of Hebrews, then argue with God, who by his Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. But one thing is manifestly clear, and it is this. Lack of men for the work of God. Lack of men for the work of God at home, for example, in the ministry. And the Church of Scotland is desperately short of men for the ministry. And it's going to be a tremendous problem by the 90s. And lack of men for the mission field of the gospel is a clear indication of the spiritual ill health of the Church of Jesus Christ. And a significant indication of the spiritual ill health, not only of the church, but of the nation. Now, Deborah stands out in this story, as women stand out in many a story. Deborah stands out because in the things of God, in in the area of spiritual awareness, in the realm of spiritual decisiveness and discernment and leadership, men had lapsed into ease and indifference, so that there was scarcely a man who could, who could be trusted with the safety and with the development and with the future of the work of God. And because the men were like that, Deborah became the leading character within the nation. There was need, spiritual need within the nation, there was obviously, and we can tell this from the story, there was obviously a desire in the heart of God to work salvation for his people. But look at chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah and Issachar faithful to Barak. Into the valley they rushed forth at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings. Oh, they had marvelous spiritual thoughts. Oh, I think maybe they went away for a retreat. It's a, it's a word that I doubt. People, we must get a different word for conferences. Retreats. Don't like that word in relation to the work of God. Among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings. Oh, 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 they read their Bibles more than, than they had done for a long time. And, and they came together and they, and they meditated. But 
but they didn't do anything. They were very spiritual. And they would have been very they would have been very cross if there had been any suggestion that they weren't spiritual. But among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Why did you tarry among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Oh, well, you see, it was getting near lambing time. And the lambs were more important than the work of God. Among the clans of Reuben, oh, it says it again, there were great searchings of heart. But Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. They, they just took no notice at all. And Dan, wh why did he abide with the ships? Well, you know, t I mean, t trade has to be looked after. Does trade come before the claims of God? Oh, let's be honest, a lot, a lot of people feel that their daily work is far more important than what they do in relation to God on a Sunday. And many, 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 many people say, Oh, 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 Mr. Lip, I, I, oh, I, I would love to be at the prayer meeting. Ah, oh, but you see, think, things are such a pressure during the week, and if, if I'm going to be out and so, ah, yes, and the, the prayer meeting gets ditched. And Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, settling down by his landings. Great spiritual meditation. But it came to nothing. Reuben, Gilead, Dan, Asher. They were all preoccupied with other things. And I found myself thinking of the story that Jesus told. And Jesus said, They all, with one consent, began to make excuses. You know the kind of thing. Not least in a congregation like this when there are real needs for people to work to maintain the work that is being done amongst young and amongst old. We were talking about this at the session meeting last Monday. And, and the elders are going to be speaking to a number of different people as, as the Spirit leads them with regard to work that needs to be done. But is it not the case that so very often people say, oh, well, you see, I, I would like to help, but... That's the story here. That's why Deborah had to do it. And that's why Barak is mentioned, because he was one of the few men who was prepared to come out and take a stand and do the work of God. I suppose, I've written down here in my notes, I suppose if there had been a prayer meeting, the men would have encouraged their wives to go. And why is it that in so many prayer meetings, Christian men are absent? In the quinquennial visitation I was doing this morning, I spoke of this from the pulpit. A minister much younger than I am, a much bigger congregation than we have. And he was telling me how few, not only of his members, but how few of his elders come to the evening service. And even fewer to the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. And when you think that this is the situation up and down the line... Now, we're, we're not talking about unconverted people. We're talking about people who make a great confession of faith and who talk about being saved and all the rest of it. But where the real work is done, where are they? And Deborah sent for Barak. I like that. Mind you, not all powerful women 
are a good influence. Not least those who are great supporters and propagators of what I believe is called the inner healing movement. If you doubt what I'm saying, read as I read not long ago the book The Seduction of Christianity it's by United Authors. One of them, I think, is a fellow gardener. It's in the Church of Scotland bookshop over towards the back and up on the left-hand side. And you will become aware of the fact that there are quite a number of movements that seem to be terribly spiritual. But on closer examination, they are undermining the fabric and the foundation of the gospel. Deborah sent for Barak. We, we are told, we are told in the chapter, I forget the, the references of chapter 5, verse 7, that Deborah was a mother in Israel, willing to love and willing to work and willing to sacrifice for the good of her children. She was a woman of faith and a woman of prayer. She was a woman who had become aware of God's timing. And she became aware of God's man. And she sent for bear. She, she, didn't, she didn't send a circular letter asking for volunteers. She said, Lord, Lord who, who should be doing this next stage of the work? And the Lord said, bear up. All right, said Deborah, I'll send for him. Always when I speak about this, I remember way back in the 19, middle 1940s, there was an old woman in Aberdeen crippled with arthritis who could hardly get out of her armchair. And she heard about a, a, an ex-Salvation Army man who had become a Church of Scotland minister and had come to a church in Aberdeen, right in the main street of Aberdeen. And this old Aberdeen wifey sent for William Still. And he went. And later on, I was sent to sit at the crippled feet of that dear old woman. She was a woman like Deborah. She had prayed and prayed. She had prayed, oh Lord, send somebody to Aberdeen. And when she heard, she knew her prayer had been answered. Well, Deborah was the same and she sent for Barak. And in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4, she says to, to Barak, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go. You know, folk in evangelical congregations nowadays react to that kind of thing. Oh, you, no, you mustn't command, you mustn't say go. You, you have to approach very tentatively. I, I wonder if you would maybe consider, and, and perhaps you might pray for the next six months or something, and then we'll talk about it again, and maybe we'll wonder and see. No, no, that's not what Deborah did. The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go. Gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking ten thousand on the tide of Naphtali. And I will draw, and the Lord says, I will draw out Sisera, Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you, and I will give him into your hand. And Deborah challenged Barak. And the man was faced with the challenge. Go in faith or refuse publicly. Oh dear, she was quite a lady, was Deborah, wasn't she? I wouldn't like to meet her if I was out of the will of God. She would know straight away. She would say, as I sometimes say to some of you, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Are you really? Oh, oh yes. How, how are you spiritually? Oh, oh all right. All right. You press the point. Deborah was like that. Face the challenge, go in faith, or refuse publicly. But then you see there was at the same time the promise of victory. And ba Barak was very aware of his limitations. And that's one of the qualifications for Christian service. 
If you've got a great opinion of your capacities, I don't think you're any use to God. He had a great a sense of, of his limitations. And he was very aware of his spiritual weakness. And if you look at verses 8, 9, and 10, you see that, that Barak had lost his assurance in God. Don't, don't read too much weakness into the bit. If, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. But he had lost his assurance in God. Now, I don't know why. Maybe it was his companions and friends or his family. I don't know. We're not told. But he consented. He said when he was challenged to go, he said, Yes, I'll go, but you must go with me. Now, I wonder if here he lost the opportunity to redeem his manliness by saying, go with me. Or on the other hand, did he recognize God's hand on Deborah in a significant way? To such an extent that that woman was a symbol of God's presence within the nation. And he wanted the assurance of her presence with him. I've written down in my notes, is it wrong to ask the help and the support of others and to ask for their company? No, it's not wrong. So long as you lean upon God, not upon them. And don't ever forget that none other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself asked his three friends, Peter, James, and John, to go with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And if the Son of God is prepared to say to his friends, I need your help in this spiritual crisis, then we should be the same. Was, was Barak's condition when he said, I'll, I'll go, but provided you go with me, was that, as I said, an indication of his desire to be sure of God's presence? Because without God, who could possibly go against the godless tide of the nation? And Barak went. And Deborah said, there will be no glory for you in this. But he still went. And there are some people who won't go and do things because there's no possibility of glory in it. And Deborah, of course, was not the kind of woman to want glory. She wasn't that kind of woman. And in any case, as we pointed out earlier, it was Jael, the other woman, who really did the, did the ultimate deed that broke the power of Sisera. And if you look at verse chapter 5, and we're almost finished, look at chapter 5, verse 20. You will see that this wasn't an ordinary battle. Some of us not all that long ago stood on the top of Mount Tabor in Israel and looked down on the plains of Israel. And we tried to imagine Deborah and Barak and the 900 chariots of this awful man. And our guide reminded us of what had happened. It was at a tremendously flat plain. And there's the river Kishon. And when there's a great sudden flash flood of rain, the water comes down the Kishon, spreads over the, 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 the valley. And what happens? What happens to chariot wheels when everything turns to mud? They stick. And that's what happened to Sisera. His main armament was put out of commission by a rainstorm. But oh, that, that marvelous verse. The kings came, verse 19, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan, verse 20. From heaven fought the stars from their... Oh, I, I, I like this. Oh, so some of these films of Star Wars and all that, it's got, it's got nothing in it. The stars in their courses fought against... Oh, I don't know what the poor man's... Maybe he saw the... the was it, maybe he thought it was flying saucers, I don't know. 
but a great manifestation of supernatural power swept down into the valley of Jezreel. And the floods came and the chariots stuck and in a moment of time that vast army of evil knew that it was beaten. It wasn't, an, it wasn't an ordinary battle. The powers of heaven fought to break the powers of evil within the nation. And there was a tremendous victory. I don't know that Beric was aware that this was going to be the dimension of the battle, but when first he went, but he went. But think of all the men in Israel who lost out on that great day of opportunity. I can imagine the children and the grandchildren of Reuben saying, Dad, we, we, we've been reading the story of, of, of Mount Tabor and the Valley of Jezreel and, and Sisera's 900 ch Dad, t tell us about it. Uh, well, I, I wasn't there. Dad, why weren't you there? I... There's no answer to that one when your children begin to ask about your spiritual life and your spiritual commitment. The Lord commands. Here's how we finish. The Lord commands. Go. What should you be doing with your life? Some of you men, should you be in the ministry? Should people here tonight be in the mission field? Should you have been in the mission field years ago? Should you be at the prayer meeting? Should you be praying in the prayer meeting? Should we be ordering our lives so that we are available to fight the battles of the Lord in the places where they're being fought and at the times when these battles are being fought. From all over the world at home and abroad there comes, there comes the call of God. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And time and time again, especially in the mission field, it is the women who answer and say, Here am I, send me.